OG Rose, and today we're going to be talking about part four of The Ward, starting with section 12. And so far we've started, um, we've talked about the Leibniz oscillation, the interesting dilemma uh, where the more similarity increases, the more we approach unveiling that things are different. We talked about the possibility of how you could have new emergent vectors arise without them being reducible to previous situations following the schema of the harmony. And section 12 will start with some possible, we'll go through some possible objections, objections and um, perhaps needs of clarification that are in the paper based on exchanges on the intellectual dark web, some of the books by Mr. Bard, some of the statements that Mr. Lung, Lung has made, and go through the schema that we've presented in the board. And I do want to stress um, in no way whatsoever do I mean to um, suggest that the board is the authority on these on these works. Uh, Bard, Alung, Ebert, all of these um, contributors, these individuals contributing to the line of thought that this paper is exploring, have their own works and their own schemas, and the board is just a... Um, a way that for me was of interest because it could combine together the work of Mr. Ebert and Mr. Alung and Mr. Bard, um, the Alexanders, and uh, I, I found um, that very interesting and based mainly on the work of Leibniz and seeing how the Leibniz oscillations based on the an analysts of situation considering Mr. Morley um, could be used to bring these works together. And, um, you know, Mr. Bard is going to stress that we don't want to have a single um, general emergence theory, and I agree with that. Um, I will argue that the Leibniz oscillation is not that. Um, there will be some quotes on how we can think about each vector as its own hard problem, the hard problem of subphysics, the hard problem of biology, the hard problem of, of consciousness, and how that can help us understand how each vector is irreducible. Now, um, there can be some objections to that, because certainly the hard problem of mind seems to really be a hard problem, while the hard problem of, say, biology, not so much. And I think that's very fair, um, as Thomas brought up on the intellectual dark webs, but I do think we should note that at one time chemistry was a hard problem, and just because something's a hard problem doesn't mean we can't begin to figure it out. At the same time, I, I don't discount the, the point that um, just saying that, say, chemistry is a hard problem doesn't necessarily make it a hard problem, and that's very true, uh, but at least thinking of it that way, we can understand that mind is, that all the vectors are irreducible, that mind is not unique as an irreducible uh, vector. Um, there, there are some par parts where Mr. Lung will, I, quite elegantly, Mr. Lung will say things. Uh, there is no perfect or universal logos. Different things require different types of logic. We can't engage with biology the same way we engage with chemistry, and so on. He very, very elegant. And I wanted in this section, section twelve, to bring out um, some of the the, the wordings that the, these different uh, individuals have uh, contributed to, and some warnings. You know, Mr. Mr. Ebert warns that if um, we can't agree on the divergence point of irreducibility, um, then we might, you, you know, to claim irreducibility could risk religioneering or creating religion or be dealing with something uh, that we just believe in. We want to believe in vector theory. Um, William Rupos, who I, whose work I, uh, con contributions I always really appreciate, that brings to mind how he says that re re reductionism, reducing things is a way that we can better understand them and uh, get a better grip around them, and that, and that should be taken into consideration. Um, so the section will just go through uh, many of these different uh, points that different people have brought up uh, and to draw attention to them because I think we, we need to get a full a, few, a full picture of the implications and metaphysical considerations that the Vord would bring to the forefront and so section 12 attempts that. Um, after section 12, starting with section 13, we will be exploring the question of vector interaction, which I think is uh, the third question that was hanging. We, we asked about um, you know, the, the how emergent vector, how vector transitions can occur. We asked questions about vector processing, but then there's this question of vector interaction, and we have a problem here, because how exactly do vectors interact without being reducible to one another? If chemistry and physics can interact, wouldn't that suggest that there's enough similarity by which relation could be possible? So wouldn't that suggest the possibility of reducibility? So you have this big problem where you have to figure out how vectors can interact without it suggesting uh, reductionism because the moment things can interact there has to be enough similarity for them to be able to interact so how can it occur the paper is basically going to argue that what Hegel calls absolute knowing we can apply to vectors and each vector will be its own absolute vector per se 
what Hegel teaches us, so Hegel teaches us many things, and one of the things he firstly teaches us, as Zizek likes to pick up on, is the impossibility of inter-subjectivity. Uh, and what that means is it's um, not possible for me to experience, to really experience the subjectivity of another person. I can know other people are subjective, but I never experience their subjectivity. I am limited within my own. Um, and I can posit that there are other subjectivities because I am limited, uh, but it is not given to me by my experience. So I actually never experience other subjectivities. Um, I only ever experience my mind. And also, though, I never actually experience, say, chemistry to chemistry. I always experience it filtered through mind. I never experience biology to biology. Um, and the idea is that, say, and we could even perhaps point to Graham Harmon's work on Triple uh, O, on object-oriented ontology, although I, I question some of it. But one of the ideas is he'll talk about is how objects don't even reach the things in themselves, you know, object. And I think that line of thought well, what he's playing on is this notion we always talk about how subjects can't get to the things themselves, and he wants to say that objects can't get to the things themselves, and that's quite fair. But the point is that I always experience everything in terms of mind. So the vector of mind experiences all the other vectors, physics and chemistry and biology and so on, in terms of mind as ideas. So likewise, the idea is that um, the animal biology always interprets uh, everything in terms of biology. Now, that doesn't mean animals um, experience plants as animals, but it would suggest that animals experience everything as part of the natural world. And it would be the idea that chemistry perhaps would experience a giraffe as a non-combusting chemical or stable chemicals or something like that. Now, I can't, I'm anthropomorphizing there, and that's always dangerous, but I'm stuck in the vector of mind, so it's very difficult for me not to do that. But the point is that every single vector relative to itself is the only vector and that vectors actually don't interact um, truly interact as they interact with themselves in the same way that subjects never truly interact with other subjects we're always actually stuck in the horizon of our own subjectivity but here's the other key move in the same way that um, the very fact that we experience our subjectivity as limitless which would mean that um, that would actually mean that we are limited from experiencing our limits. And if you're limited from experiencing your limits, then you experience them as limitlessly. And, the, and that's uh, absolute knowing is when you come to realize that your limitless experience of the subject is actually evidence that you are limited. In the same way that every vector experiences itself as limitless, as the vector. But you see the very fact that every vector experiences itself as the vector is evidence that there's actually other vectors. Um, the very fact that every vector seems limitless to itself, that it do would suggest there are other vectors. Um, and we get to choose now, of course, I, I think we have to talk about the absolute choices, I like to call it, where we choose if the experience of limitlessness is evidence of having limits or indeed is evidence of limitlessness. We have to choose that. Similarly, we have to choose if the fact that a vector can only experience itself is evidence of other vectors. Uh, because it is limited as a vector, or if indeed chemistry is the only vector, if indeed physics is the only vector. Um, but that would be reductionist. So we have a choice uh, if we want to go that route or not. But given, I think, the very fact that you see unique processes, that mind does not operate the same as chemicals, I think there would be very good reason to think that there is um, different vectors that are not um, ir that are not reducible to one another. Uh, but the point is that in the same way that subjects never interact with other subjects, vectors actually do not interact with other vectors at themselves. It's always filtered. Um, yes, vectors interact in so much as they embody and participate um, in other vectors. And likewise, I as a subject interact with other subjects in so much as I experience them and filter them into my experience, but I don't experience them as they experience themselves. So for me, we can understand how there can be vector interaction without, vector reduc without reductionism um, if we consider absolute knowing in terms of vectors and we consider every vector an absolute vector per se. Uh, and, and so what you can say in the same way that you can talk about the impossibility of intersubjectivity, you can kind of talk about the um, impossibility of intervectivity is what I want to call it. So intervectivity is not possible. You cannot have other ve vectors be other vectors. They can um, embody and participate, but they cannot become one another. Ergo, they cannot be reduced to one another. Now, as we move toward the end of the paper, we're going to be talking again about the question of transhumanism. And the reason is because transhumanism kind of points to and suggests, suggests the next 
emergent vector or what we could be heading toward. And there's this question of if, if transhumanism is going to be something that we transition into, thus the trans and the transhuman is tra transitional, or if it's transcendent, something that's transcendent of humanity. And what's funny to think is if something that transcends humanity is actually an effacement. If it transcends us, is that not an effacement? So there's this notion that the transhuman needs to be something we can process, that we can transition into, that it cannot be so other that we can't relate to it. And this points back to what we talked about with Leibniz. If the transhuman proves to be purely different, then we won't be able to relate to us, uh, relate to it, and thus it could be a kind of effacement. Or will the transhuman be something that we can transition to? We have discussed the impossibility of intervectivity, but we've also said that it's possible we could participate in the transhuman. Will that be the case? Well, we're left with the question. Um, I break it down between if the transhuman will be a creature out of Lovecraft, one of the great ancient ones that we cannot process, an event, capital E event, that we cannot process into a lowercase e event, therefore into our terms, and therefore it will overwhelm us and efface us. Or will the transhuman be a kind of Jesus, which is a purely man, purely God is this hypostatic union bothness of which then would be something that we can transition into. You know, Jesus, there's this kind of idea that God invites man into himself through Jesus, which is possible because Jesus is kind of tra a transition, a kind of bridge between the divine and human. Um, thus, he is a transhuman. He's a transitional kind of human per se. He's a bridge for humanity. Um, often you'll see in theology the cross described as this kind of bridge laid, laid across a, her, her, um, a ravine that you can then walk across. And we can think about that as the uh, break between the divine and the human. Well, alternatively, you could have the um, transhuman be a Lovecraft, a creature, an ancient one, a Coachella that the very experience of would overwhelm and destroy you. So this is the million dollar question, Jesus or Lovecraft, Jesus or this um, great ancient one. And that is what we must prepare for. With the, with the transhuman event that, that is coming. And I think uh, we do need to think of it this way, which vector theory can help us arise to, because if we think that there has been irreducible differences and that there's been emergences, I think we can kind of, when we don't think that way, we can think of the transhuman as being something that um, we will be in control of, that will not give rise to properties that we cannot control because everything is reducible in our mind. Therefore, everything is controllable. But you see, if in fact it's possible for something to emerge that is irreducible, then it could be something outside of our control. And what will we do with that? How will we handle it? Are we ready for it? Um, it's not Without vector theory, it's arguably not even a possibility in our thinking. And I'll describe this possibility space, this new emergent vector perhaps, this new emergence uh, as this open bracket this sort of space that we have to prepare for and choose uh, to move toward. And the probability of us preparing for it, I think, is very low without a... Um, without taking the question of death seriously, which I know Mr. Bard and Dr. Last are working on and that Johannes talks about, I think it's very low if we don't take seriously that the great, the moment, the supreme moment where we think we're going to get unity is going to unveil absolute difference, which we learned from Mr. Morley, Leibniz, and Mr. Ebert. Um, if, we, and, uh, if we don't take this seriously, uh, the, the, the thoughts that, the, that these, these minds have given us, that a lung has given us with irreducibility, thus there being the possibility of something emerging, which cannot be reduced to us and thus cannot be controlled. Um, again, if we think that reducibility is possible, then the transhuman then will be the truth of the transhuman per se, in the same way that we treat physics as the truth of reality, because it's the lowest vector, we'll think that the that will be the truth of the transhuman, and that will set, up, set us up for failure, because it may not uh, be reducible to us at all. So Mr. Alung can prepare us. So all of these thinkers come together to help us move into the future, to move into what's to come in a manner that we rise to the occasion as opposed to overwhelm, overwhelm us. There's this way, um, the end of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland has that famous three word shanti 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 which is always very interesting to me because it's peace that passeth understanding well peace that passeth understanding is one it's either one of two things it's something we cannot access and that we will never access or it is something that because we conditioned ourselves appropriately and we prepared ourselves appropriately it is a peace that cannot be understood only experienced and those who experience it will experience something that's worth experiencing indeed. For more, by Alexander Bard, Cadell Last, Alex Ebert, Johannes Nieberhauser, and Alexander Lung, and Mr. Morley, and Leibniz, I would 
check out their respected works, their respected YouTube stations, uh, the conversations. Uh, you can find many of the conversations of these gentlemen on Dr. Last's um, YouTube channel on Johannes Nieberhauser over at the Halcon Guild. I've had a discussion with Mr. Alung um, on O.G. Rowe's conversations. The Return to Metaphysics is also a good example where these topics are picked up on. And Mr. Alexander Ebert is in the Philosophy of Black series. He is presented as at the Stoa on his theories. I highly suggest them. And Mr. Morley, uh, who runs Intrinsic Research Co., uh, has a magnificent book on uh, Leibniz that has taught me much that I'm grateful for. All of these individuals have created work that has taught me much, and I have hoped in this paper to draw attention to their contributions to my thinking and to show gratitude for it. From them, I have learned much.